I'll talk a little bit about my creative process because I personally feel like composition is one small part of a much bigger process, but what comes before and comes after composition, like it all fits together. Um, so we need to talk about each piece of the puzzle. And then I will talk about seven essential concepts. So some lessons that I think are particularly important with regard to composition. And then I'll hopefully share a lot of really practical examples so that you can see what I'm talking about put into action. And I'll allow a lot of time at the end for questions. Uh, this is a pretty packed presentation, so I personally find that it's easier to get through the material and then answer lots of questions at the end. So just FYI, if you have a question, um, you can save it and then we can go through it at the end. So when I think about composition, I think about it fitting into a four piece puzzle related to uh, like how you create a photograph. So composition, light, and subject selection are all equal parts of coming up with a photograph of nature, with all encompassed in the important piece of your vision. So I see photography as the way that I express my view of the natural world. So the thing, my composition is filtered through that vision. The type of light that I like is filtered through that vision, and the things that I'm attracted to, same thing. So my vision drives all of my decisions, just as how your vision will drive all of your decisions. And later on, I'll talk a little bit about some of the themes in my compositions, and those themes come straight from my vision. So for example, I really like having an organized world. Like the world right now is so incredibly chaotic, and one of the ways that I can find order um, is through my photography. And so that comes out a lot in my compositions just as an example of how your vision and how you see the world will influence these kinds of things. So even though we may implement some of these ideas differently, I hope that you'll still find a lot of these ideas to be helpful for your own photography. So the basis of our discussion today is what is composition? And when you, if you look up what is composition or, or get a book on composition, they're often really complicated, detailed definitions, and I don't necessarily think that complexity is helpful in this case. So I go with a really simple definition. I think of composition as the arrangement, interaction, and flow of elements within the four borders of your photographic frame. So the key elements here are going to be arrangement, interaction, and flow. So arrangement is things like the spacing that you have between your different elements, the way that they're oriented in relation to your rectangular frame. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about arrangement later on when I talk about some of the, the lessons. Uh, in terms of interaction, I think about that as then how elements relate to one another. So do you have two things that are really close together? Because that communicates something different than if you have two elements that are far apart. Uh, so how different pieces of a composition interact with one another. And again, I'll go into a lot more examples of what I mean by some of these things. And then flow is how your eye flows through the frame. So what do you linger on? Um, are there any things that are particularly interesting uh, where your the flow is going to lead a viewer to that thing that is particularly interesting? Or are there maybe visual elements that force a viewer's eye out of the frame? So thinking about both positive ways that a composition can flow and then some negative ways. So again, the three things that I think are most important when thinking about a definition of composition, arrangement, interaction, and flow. And then these things, as I mentioned before, I think are always filtered through how you want to express your view of the world. So whether it's nature or architecture or portraits uh, or any type of photography, it's the, how you view your subjects. In the case of nature, um, I see personal expression as how I interpret and connect with the natural world. So the three key ideas here will be uh, like how I'm interpreting what I see in front of me, what I'm connecting with, and what some of my visual preferences are. And then I express these ideas through my compositions. So uh, you'll see a lot of repetition. Repetition is something I use a lot in my photography. So that's a way that I express, again, my desire to organize the world is, uh, is through repetition and order. So that would be an example of one of my visual preferences. So all of these things come together in terms of how I put together my compositions. 
So I, I just feel like it's important to preface any talk like this about kind of how I come to nature photography so that you can understand uh, how this comes out in my photographs and how it might come out differently in your photographs. So four essential ideas that I think of when I think about composition all come down to these things that you see in front of you. The general theme is that we can't control nature, but we can control how we approach composition. So this means that you can decide what to include and exclude. So I think often about what do I want to keep out of my frame, because inclusion and exclusion are both equally important in my mind. Uh, I think about or I'm able to decide how I arrange things within my frame. So those are decisions that are left up to me. Like, do I want to choose a different orientation? Do I want to have tighter framing, looser framing? Like, those are all things that I can decide. Uh, making deliberate choices, so really being careful about what I decide to include or exclude or how I arrange something or what details I choose to focus on, those kinds of deliberate choices really elevate a composition. Uh, when I'm teaching workshops, I see this often where a, a workshop participant has a really good idea. They just haven't, they, they feel tempted to move on to the next thing before really refining what they have in front of them. And that step of just slowing down a little bit and spending a little time on refining a composition and making some really deliberate choices can take a decent photograph and turn it into something really extraordinary. And then, uh, especially when we're working with small scenes, so I do a lot with intimate landscapes and plants, uh, we're photo really focused on small details in nature. And so details like dirt spots or imperfections in a leaf or on a flower, those kinds of things can really matter. So paying attention to those details and then focusing on them as part of the composition process can really elevate a photograph. So another basis of this presentation, I, I think of this as when people talk about the rules. So tell me what the rules are of nature photography. And my response is that I see these rules as stifling creativity, experimentation, and personal expression. So I generally like to toss out the rules uh, because when you read some photography books or if you spend very much time hanging around landscape photographers, you hear a lot of these rules. So things like only shoot during the golden hour or flat light is boring, bright colors are great, every landscape needs a foreground. So all of these things, I, most of my portfolio is the opposite of these things. So I feel like these, these rules are particularly limiting and I think that goes for composition as well. Like you hear a lot about how photos have to have depth. You should use the rule of thirds. You should never center your subject. You should always use leading lines and S curves like, to lead a viewer into the frame. Well, that's, I don't really think that's always true. It really depends on what you want to communicate about how you're connecting with nature. So I personally toss out almost all of these rules. I use some of these ideas when they're appropriate, but I feel like rules are really stifling. So from my perspective, with regard to composition and nature photography in general, I really don't think there's a right or a wrong. Instead, uh, your vision, goals, visual preferences, and connections with nature should drive the decisions that you make, not rules. So uh, I'm approaching our discussion today about composition as we're working with building blocks and tools in a toolbox. So concepts instead of rules. Uh, a, a concept is something that you can have in mind and you can can pull from a range of ideas to say this works really well with this particular scene instead of a rule which like the rule of thirds like you have to place a, your subject on the third of your frame well in some cases that just doesn't make sense so from my perspective photos can work with or without complying with any of the traditional rules of photography so we're going to go through this discussion with the idea of concepts things that you can put in your toolbox and ideas that you can have at your disposal next time you're out photographing nature or any other subject that you're interested in. Some of my composition themes, so this goes back to the idea of personal expression, like how I express my view of the natural world through my photography, and you'll see this all throughout this presentation. So I really focus on things that, like ways to organize chaos. 
So nature is very chaotic and I search for strategies and approaches that organize that chaos to make it neater and tidier. Um, I really like to elevate the idea of harmony and grace in my photography. I focus a lot on simp simple compositions uh, and just things that bring order. So one of the things you hear about when you're first learning nature photography is how you should never center your composition because it's boring. Well, in my case, I, I really want to convey harmony through my photography. So sometimes a centered composition makes a lot of sense. So things like centered compositions and symmetry promote order and harmony. So even if you have a totally different approach, the concepts that we're going to talk about today are flexible enough that you can apply them to your own photography. You just might apply them in a different way than I apply these ideas to my photography. And these ideas can apply to any different type of scene, from portraits of plants and flowers to abstracts, so kind of uh, natural or rendi abstract renditions of natural subjects, to intimate landscapes, so a smaller scene within a scene, to grand landscapes. So everything that we're going to talk about applies to anything that you're going to photograph in nature. So the first thing that we can talk about, now specifically about composition, is how composition choices share messages and tell stories. So uh, this whole idea about being able to put ideas, kind of nebulous ideas into words, is something that really helped improve my composition skills. So when I could take an idea that I was seeing in it, or I was able to assess the composition in front of me and put my decisions and the themes that I was seeing into words, that was really helpful in helping me elevate my compositional skills, which is why I'm going to share these next exercises with you, because I hope that if, if you're trying to improve your composition skills, you might also find this to be a helpful approach. So compositions can share all of these different kinds of messages, from being a really energetic composition to being a really peaceful composition, or something that, that conveys mysteriousness boldness, gracefulness. So these are all kinds of moods and emotions that compositions can convey. Here's an example. So these are two locations in Death Valley National Park, and they're 15, about 15 minutes apart from each other. So clearly the subject matter is a little bit different, but they're still in really, really close proximity. So I, I wanted to compare and con contrast these two photos because they send such incredibly different messages. So in one case, or the weather and the light obviously influences the, what some of the messages sent by these photos, but the compositions also share very different messages. So in the example of the salt flats on the left, I was standing up tall. So my tripod was fully extended and I was up high above the scene. So that gives a more distant and removed perspective versus getting really, really low where my tripod was maybe eight to 10 inches above the, these mud cracks, that that's a much more assertive and dominant type of position. So just something like changing your position in terms of your composition, especially with a grand landscape, you can share very different messages. So one, one of these compositions is much more harmonious and graceful, the other is much more bold and assertive. So just an example of how a composition can share and convey a particular message. Here are some other examples of the same scene with different composition and slightly different processing choices in the case of the color versus black and white on the right. Uh, but in the first example on the left, you can see how one, the top composition tells more of a story of a, gr a small grouping of trees uh, that's particularly colorful, but you get a sense of the individual character of the trees versus the photo on the bottom tells you a much a more expansive story. Like this is the story of a full hillside of trees. So you're, you're, by zooming in a lot more, you're telling a different story about individual trees versus a forest. Or in the case of the ice, so the middle two photos, in one of these cases, facing those really dramatic cracks, that, that shares a message of where you can probably kind of tell what you're looking at, the cracks going through the ice, uh, that's a pretty bold composition. And then I turned 180 degrees and took the photo without the cracks. And that's a much more abstract rendition of the scene. Like you aren't quite sure what you're looking at. I think it almost looks like kind of um, like a fantasy galaxy or something, 
Uh, so one's a pretty literal interpretation, one's a more abstract interpretation. There's really no sense of scale in the one at the bottom, or with the photo at the bottom. So those two composition choices just share totally different messages. And then in the case of the examples on the right, uh, the, both of these are sand dunes. They're this same patch of sand dunes taken slightly different times of day. So the lower one had a little bit more direct light. So that obviously changes the, the photo a little bit and it's clearly processed in black and white. But with the top version, just when we're looking at composition, the wider view, you see a lot more graceful lines and you have a little bit more context. Uh, so you see more patterns on the top and the bottom. And I think that composition just generally feels, kind of puts me more at ease. Where the bottom composition, focusing in on those really strong vertical lines, is just a more aggressive uh, composition. So these are three examples of how the exact same scene with different composition choices can share an entirely different message. So now we'll go through a little exercise about how to put your ideas about compositions and your photos into words. So I would encourage you to do this with your own photos. So studying some of your photographs and think about how you would describe the mood of the photo and then identify some things both large and small that catch your eye and then use some of those things to, you, to describe the compositional elements behind the photographs. So after this presentation today, you could choose two or three of your photos and go through and try to put the compositional concepts behind the photo into words. And I think if, if you've ever struggled with composition, you might find that doing this over time really helps you kind of hone in on like, here's the scene in front of you. Like, what do you like about it? What's catching your eye? Like, what are those, those things that you could then use to craft a tighter and more refined composition? And now I'll take this or this activity and we'll actually do it with a couple of the photos that I'm, I'll share today. So just for, for a few, like a few seconds, think of these photos in front of you and think of a couple of words that come to mind for each of these compositions. So uh, the, photo, the photo on the left is from Yellowstone National Park in winter and the photo on the right is from Death Valley National Park uh, on a stormy morning. So uh, think about a few of the compositional concepts, like what are some of the things, the ideas that I used when I pulled together these compositions. So I'll wait for about 10 seconds before I head on to the next slides. Just to give you a little bit of a chance to think about some of the composition ideas that you see. And yeah, then I'll tell you type, what I type in the chat so that she can see uh, what, what you're doing, right? Is that what you, you want people to type it? People don't need to because I, I actually can't see the chat on my end. Oh, right okay. Now. Never mind. So, yeah, for some reason, I'm not seeing the chat. So that was my plan, but since I can't see it, that doesn't help. <laughs> so just think of some, comp some words. Okay. Now that you've had a chance to think, I can share some of the words that I use to describe these compositions. So the first, um, in this case, I see that there's a pretty gentle progression from the foreground to the background between the pool and then the middle geyser and then the, the back geyser. And I'll show these photos without the diagrams again so you can see what I mean by all these things. Um, the atmosphere of the steam helps add some depth. So that adds, the steam adds some layers. So that's a compositional element that if the steam weren't there, you wouldn't have the same amount of depth. Uh, the pool is dominant and has a lot of visual weight. And I'll talk a little bit more about what visual weight is. So, and there's a, a geyser in the background. I don't, can you see my mouse, Carlos? Maybe, maybe not. Yes, I can see it. Okay, so this geyser here in the background, uh, that is a really tiny bit of the scene but it takes up a lot of visual weight because it's an essential piece in the background of the frame. So we can think of the pool having a lot of visual weight, but it's really large, and the geyser having visual weight, but it's really small. Uh, then there's a counterpoint, so the, kind of a di along a diagonal. So the pool and then that first steaming geyser, those are counterpoints. And then when you add in, so you have the counterpoint between the pool 
and this middle geyser, and then you add in the background geyser, uh, which is castle geyser, and that forms a triangle. So when I was actually standing at this point or at this place trying to arrange the composition, I was thinking a lot about the arrangement between those three elements and how they flow and how they interact. Because if we had more straight on view of the, like if this was more of a, a straight relationship, then this scene wouldn't be quite as dynamic. So that strong diagonal creates some dynamism. And the fact that the composition is a little bit of off-centered, um, some of those things can help create a more visually dynamic composition. And then I also allow a lot of breathing room ar around all of the elements. So those are some of the words that I would use to describe this composition. So this next example is a pretty different scene uh, in terms of some of the compositional concepts. So in, the, in this example, we had a strong di diagonal. In this example, it's strongly centered. Like, there are a lot of elements in here that are very centered. Uh, the clouds and the, the patterns in the foreground are the dominant focal points. Uh, I feel like it's pretty balanced, but there are some compromises on the edges. For example, these little patterns get a little too close to the edge for my taste, but in this kind of situation, you're, you're just going to have to compromise about some of those things. Uh, there's a lot of repetition uh, both in the patterns in the foreground and then that's kind of mirrored into the sky. So we have symmetry in terms of the right to left symmetry and the top to bottom symmetry because the, the way the patterns in the, the foreground radiate, the clouds also radiate. There's a really strong network of curving lines uh, and the feeling of the composition just radiates expansiveness. So uh, those are some of the ideas that came to mind when I was coming up with this particular composition. And these are all things that when I started out in photography, absolutely were not natural. Like it, it's taken a lot of work to be able to, to learn these ideas and then have them be innate and intuitive when working out in the field. But these are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm working on a scene like this. And here you can see the, the compositions again without those diagrams. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of some of the, the ways that I think about composition and the, the concepts and words that I tr am trying to use when I'm actually out in the field doing this kind of work. I'm gonna take a sip of water. All right. So now we are going to talk a little bit about composition and the creative process as I see it. And everybody's creative process will differ a little bit, but I think this, that putting, again, some words to a really nebulous idea can sometimes be helpful. And I see that my, my for some reason, my font is a little bit off on this, so I, I apologize for those T's that are dropped in the wrong places. Um, but generally, this is what my creative process looks like, and it has these seven steps, which we're going to talk through each of them. So explore, observe, connect, ideas, composing, refining, and photographing. So that's taking a really mixed up and nebulous process and putting it into a linear diagram. And I think that I don't go through this in this kind of really linear way. It's more just to encapsulate these seven ideas. And I can say that the first four steps, I'm all over the place. Like I'm physically wandering around and exploring a lot and doing a lot of different things. And then once I get to the point of composing a photograph, then I do get into a much more linear process where it's consistent, I'm thinking through the same things, and then I'm making the, the same, I have a pretty linear step, uh, set of steps that I do with technical decisions like shutter speed and aperture and some of those things. So the first part of my process, the first four steps are really nebulous, and then the last three are very refined and much more linear. And I will mention that on the, the little pink stars on here are ideas, and then the little green star is an idea that I then want to work with. So uh, I have a lot of ideas and I'm looking for connections, but then once I have an idea that I want to hone in on, that's kind of when I turn from the more nebulous process to the much more linear process. So the first step in my creative process is actual physical and visual exploration. 
So I always think of this as being curious about what's over the next hill or around the next bend. I arrive early and I stay late. Um, I think of my photographic style as slowing down and wandering around because I just, I want, I physically wander around a lot and I'm curious about what I'm seeing in front of me. And I feel like without exploration, it's really hard to find unique compositions so, uh, and subjects. So with exploration comes opportunities. So the next step in my creative process is obser observing. And I spend a lot of time observing because I feel like observation creates opportunities. Uh, this is another kind of bedrock of my photographic process uh, is that the more that I can see what's around me, the more opportunities I'll have for photography. And I think about this as distilling a scene and then looking for details. So this is a lake that's about 20 miles down the road from my house here in southwestern Colorado. And uh, this is the standard scene that most people go to photograph. There's, this is, it's an, uh, it's not a reservoir, but it's like a, it has a little dam. So you can stand on the dam and face these mountains. It looks beautiful in the fall, uh, but this is kind of the thing that people go to photograph. They get out of their car, take the sunrise photo, and then leave. But this is one of the, my favorite places in Colorado to just explore and see what you see, because every time I'm there, I find something new. So instead of just focusing on the lake and the reflection, I want to see what's in front of me beyond those things. And I'm sorry about the fonts on this. I've, I'd have no idea why I'm, I, all of these things are out of order, or like not looking correctly in terms of formatting. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but back to the point. So this grand landscape is what most people photograph, but we're interested in distilling a scene. So going far beyond what is the most obvious thing because observations create opportunities for compositions. So I'm looking at the grand forms, like what do the mountains look like? What does the lake look like? What's happening in the sky? What is the weather doing? Is there any interesting atmosphere? What's happening with the light? So is it overcast? Is it bright middle of the day? Is it twilight? Like, and based on the, those qualities, what are the opportunities for photography? Uh, what is my mood? So what am I interested in on that particular day? What is the mood of the scene in front of me? Uh, what are some of the intimate landscapes? So the scenes within the scene, what is happening with the plants? So I, I'm looking to see what, are, what kind of trees are there? What kind of plants are there? What's catching my eye? Um, are there little tiny details like lichen on a rock or uh, particularly small plants that are interesting? Are there any reflections, like patterns in the reflections, like that it would be an abstract rendition? What's happening at my feet? What, ha what is happening in the sky? So I'm looking for all of those details beyond this grand scene. So by distilling the scene into lots of little details, you can always be observing and then find things that turn into compositions. So for me, I'm always looking for things like patterns and repetition, interesting textures, shapes and lines, and light and shadow, because these are qualities that can, they're, they're abstract qualities, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that you can then use to create a composition. So these are some things in my office, just to show how, even if you're observing at the grocery store or you're observing in your house, you might come up with some ideas that can translate into photos. So looking at the light and shadows, the ripples of curtains, or the pattern on my desk chair, the pattern on my rug, the bubbles on the lamp that's by my desk, or my, the way my cat is laying, like the shape that she's laying in. These are all ideas that, like just practicing those kinds of observational skills then turn into photographs. So all of these ideas that you see here, you can find those same ideas in nature. You just have to get used to observing them. Um, so these are some photographs that have very similar compositional concepts as the things in my office. So this is why I feel like it's really helpful to always be observing what you see around you. So the bottom line is observations create opportunities for compositions and creating photographs. And then the next idea in, or the next step in my creative process is connecting. And I see connections as one of the, the basic pieces of personal expression. So what I connect with in nature is going to be different than what you connect with. 
But either way, connect, connections and sparks are the seeds of compositions. So that thing that I'm connected to that I'm like, that's really interesting. How could I turn that into a photograph? That's really where, the, uh, for me, a photograph starts happening. And I let my mood and, con and the conditions in front of me drive those connections. So sometimes I'm, I just don't feel like doing grand landscape work. Uh, so I'm going to, or I just feel like wandering around and that's going to drive the things that I'm connecting with. Um, and I always try to be open to serendipity and sparks of inspiration. So this means that that lake that I was talking about that, with, that I showed a couple of times previously, instead of saying, I'm going to go photograph sunset at that lake, it's like, I'm going to go to the lake and I'm going to see what I see. And then I'm going to let serendipity guide what I photograph. And I'll show two examples of that. So this is some, uh, or a huckleberry plant at Mount St. Helens in Washington. And this is an example of how we went on an eight mile hike to see Mount St. Helens. And this is what I ended up photographing that day. This was the photograph that I liked the most. I was fascinated with the hike and I absolutely loved seeing Mount St. Helens, but this was the thing that I walked away with because that's what I connected with. Uh, we were in Florida visiting a friend who's a bird photographer, and this invasive plant, water lettuce, uh, in, that was growing at a wildlife refuge is the thing that I connected with most. So we were there to see the birds, but the bird, I'm not much of a bird photographer, so I, I did a little bit of bird photography because it was just fun to stretch my skills, but the, this plant was the thing that I was connecting with the most. So even though I was going to see Mount St. Helens and going to see birds, the things that I connected with were these two plants. So I let those connections drive my photography and then my composition. So once I have those connections in mind, then I start working with ideas. So the connection is saying, oh, like this, this water lettuce plant, like those patterns are really, really interesting. Like I've connected now to this plant. That then I say, well, how could I present this as a photograph? So that's when I start thinking like, what are my options here? What type of framing might work? Would this be best with a longer lens or should I do a more expansive scene? Like what about this scene do I really like the most and I wanna highlight? What do I wanna minimize? So this is when I start thinking like, maybe it's time to pull out my phone and see how framing this might work or maybe pull out my camera without setting up my tripod and just test out some ideas. And this is where the, now I'm starting to move towards actually creating a photograph. And now is where I start to get into a much more linear and consistent process. So composition is the next step. And this is where I actually start framing a scene. So making a choice of like, I'm going to put on my 100 to 400 lens and I want an isolated view of this particular patch of of plants, or I want a much more expansive view. So this is where I start to test specific framing options, and I'm working through some very specific ideas, and based on that, those first kind of test, test photographs, then I decide whether or not I'm going to move forward. Um, and then sometimes it also means I think there's something here, but this just isn't the right time, so I might need to come back at a different time. Uh, so this is the point at which I have my tripod set up usually, or if I'm hand holding my, photo, my camera photographing plants or flowers or something like that, that I have an idea and I've come up with a composition that I like. Um, I've started taking photographs possibly, um, but the next step I think is the most important step as part of the composition and that's refining. Whoops, I skipped a slide, sorry about that. So uh, with composition, we are going to go back to that whole idea of deliberate choices. So you decide what you can in, want to include or exclude. You decide how you're arranging things within your frame. You're considering what you want to emphasize or de-emphasize in terms of relationships and interactions and all sorts of other things uh, related to the scene in front of you. And then you're going to start looking for distractions and differences in details and imperfections. So these are all the deliberate choices that you can make related to composition uh, that I think from my perspective help elevate the scene. So you've connected with something in nature, you've framed it up, and now you're making some of those choices like should I zoom in a little bit? Should I 
move, move my, uh, my camera just a little bit to get a different angle and so that things are arranged in a slightly different way oriented to the edges of the frame. Uh, is there something distracting that I need to address? That these are all deliberate choices that are essential pieces of the composition process. Um, and again, you can't control nature, but you can control how you approach these specific choices. And this leads directly into the next step of the process, which is refining. So this is where I often actually physically stop what I'm doing, kind of relax, kind of recenter myself, and then even look away from the LCD and then come back with fresh eyes and look at, if, and this is, this is if I've specifically framed up something with my tripod versus experimenting with hand-holding. So let's say that you have your tripod set up, you step away, you take a deep breath, and then you come back with fresh eyes and say like, what's, how does this look? Uh, are there little details that I need to be more careful about? Like, how do my edges look? How do my corners look? Are there things that are really catching my eye that are distracting? Like, let's say there's like some, some dead grasses that are laying on the ground that you could that uh, without doing any damage to the scene, that you could pull those out to minimize distractions. So those are all the details that take a, a good composition and turn it into a great composition, a really, really well re refined, deliberate composition. So that refining process. Uh, and I'll give an example here of how I go through those couple, those first six steps. So this was in Death Valley National Park and we went to this spot to photograph colorful, uh, rocks color, covered in colorful lichen. So the plan was lichen, but as we were driving up, we saw these backlit grasses. And I've been wanting to photograph a scene like this for a long time. So it was just like the right time of year, just the right time of day, where the hillside was in shadow, but the grasses were in the light. So it's like, I, that was where I connected. So I had the, we were exploring and, kind of getting out into nature, the a thing that I, was, I thought I would connect with would be the lichen, but I actually connected with these backlit grasses. So I decided I'm going to work with these. Uh, then as I started working with them, I'm thinking, well, you know, I should move up on top of a hill because I think that I could get a different perspective. So then once I was on top of the hill, then I started having some really specific ideas. I put on my longer lens and I started isolating the scene and working through all of these different iterations. So this is the point at which I'm testing different framing. So do I like, uh, like in the very first example, I felt like that wasn't balanced enough. And then in the second example, it felt like that green bush, that's Mormon tea, that uh, bush is called Mormon tea. The Mormon tea ephedra bush was just, it had too much visual weight. So maybe I should actually expand my framing. Well, no, because there are some distractions. Like the top is kind of a distraction and there are some distractions on the right side. Back to the tighter framing. Um, and then kind of just iterating through those different ideas to see what might work the best. Um, so this is an example of how composition and refining can be a really iterative process. So you've connected with an idea or you've connected with a subject in nature, you have an idea, and then you start working through some different op options for composition. So this is how I work through this entire process when I'm out in the field. And if I were to choose a, a composition to process, it would be one of the bottom three, probably the middle one. This one is a, a rough process in Lightroom, uh, but I like the intersecting ridges and the fact that the, the plants themselves are pretty balanced. I also like this, this one on the lower left as well. Um, I can find problems in all the rest of them. But this is just an example of how I go through this kind of process actually when I'm out in the field. And then finally, the technical decisions related to actually creating a photograph. And in terms of composition, I think of two things as being essential to the uh, two technical decisions that directly relate to composition and that's depth of field and shutter speed. So uh, that first one, again, the problem with the font, I think I must have used a font for this presentation that's no longer on my computer. Um, but in the, the, that first one says fully in focus with details throughout. So 
uh, this is how depth of field can affect composition, where on the left, we have full details. And then on the right, we have a much more abstract rendition with shallow depth of field. So uh, that, that depth of field as a compositional choice can make a huge difference in, in how your subject looks in the end. So that's an important technical decision that relates to composition. And then shutter speed. So uh, in both of these cases, a longer sh I chose a longer shutter speed because I wanted the curve of the waves in the example on the left. And then that particular pattern of water I thought looked the most pleasing in terms of the composition for the photograph on the right. So uh, I always, it, when, whenever anything's moving or like water or wind or something else in your scene is moving or depth of field is an issue, those are the only two technical decisions that I think of in relationship to composition. So with that, we can now move on to the actual seven things that I think are essential composition concepts, so tools for your, your toolbox. But before we go into the examples, I will talk about two of my photos that I think did not work at all. Um, in my new ebook on composition, one of the pieces of feedback that I've received is that people found these fails to be one of the most helpful things. So seeing what doesn't work so that you can then apply those ideas to what might work um, so I'm going to show you two photos that I don't think worked particularly well. So take a minute or a few seconds to look at this photo and think through a few things that you don't think worked very well. Okay, now I can share what I think are the issues and why I consider this a composition fail. And the main theme is that all the visual cues that you see in front of you are a mess. So uh, the, the lines are pointing in all sorts of different directions and they're not terribly cohesive. Like the, the main lines in the, the mud flats are I think pointing to the most uninteresting part of the scene. There's nothing really interesting in the background. So just together the visual cues to me don't work. There's also no breathing room at the top. So here, these lines lead to the bushes, which I don't think are particularly interesting, and they lead you on out of the frame. This is generally pretty heavy on the right, so we have a lot going on on the right and not as much going on on the left. Um, there's, the, like all of these tiles I feel are pretty unattractive. Like this is just messy. This here is tight, whereas this here is really expansive. So those are two examples where it just doesn't feel balanced. So there's so much happening on the right and not much happening on the left. Uh, and then this bush here is really tight on the edge, this big empty space that you see here. So those are all things that I think just together mean that this photograph just is not cohesive. So here's another example. Uh, this one's from one of the high alpine basins here in southwestern Colorado. And this was one of the first photos I took where I was like, oh my gosh, I love this photo. I feel like I'm finally making progress. And now I look at it and I just am like, oh, it's a mess. Um, but it's a good learning, learning opportunity. So this time, try, to, try doing some of those little diagrams, the arrows and circles in your own mind, or you can follow along with me as I go through some of the examples of what I think don't work. Um, so the most interesting things here, to me, don't have any visual weight. So I feel like this waterfall is probably the most interesting thing, and the flowers. And they both just blend in. The, these, this section of the photo, I think, has the most interesting things going on, but they're just so small that they don't attract enough attention. This cascade, instead, is just massive. And then this spot down here, in the lower left is just completely empty. So um, it, if we divided the frame in half, there's a lot going on on the left and not nearly as much going on on the right. So it feels really uh, unbalanced to me. Um, and then I feel like the, the foreground is way too expansive and the background is way too condensed. And then finally, this jumble of rocks to me just doesn't make any sense. It's too small to really see what's going on, but it's too big in the sense that it attracts your attention. 
So those are some of the things that I think don't work in this photograph. Um, but I've revisited both of similar scenes and I feel like I've done better. So here's an example of some mud flats in Death Valley in the same sand dunes. I feel like this is a much more cohesive and interesting composition. Uh, and then the wildflowers with mountains. Like these are just, I feel, two examples of taking the same concepts but refining them a lot more and really focusing a lot more on the details. They're much more balanced. I feel like the flow makes a lot more sense and I focused a lot more on the details. So can go from those, some of those problems, learning those lessons and then doing better next time I'm out in the field. So taking those fails, we'll now talk through about seven ideas that you can use to improve your compositions. And this is this single slide, I think, is the most important lesson in all of these slides that I'm going through today. So if you take one thing from this presentation, I would say take this. Um, and that is that we are not photographing mountains necessarily, we're photographing triangles. So our literal subject is mountains, but we're actually photographing shapes and forms. So those are more abstract qualities. So we can take our literal subjects that we, so let's say we have a scene in front of us that includes mountains and trees and plants and lakes and clouds. Those are all the literal things that we're, those are the things that we get out in nature because we love those things. But we're actually also photographing abstractions. So things like shapes and forms and light and colors, metaphors, associations. So all those abstract qualities are additional things that we can use in our compositions. So by learning to see beyond the literal qualities of the scene in front of us, we're then able to have more tools at our disposal to create compositions. So in this scene, the subjects are things like trees and wildflowers and mist. So those are all the literal subjects that we're photographing. But if we look beyond those literal subjects, we see this. We see some trees in the background, so the yellow triangles. Those are all repeating forms. And then we see the midground trees. So those are a different type of shape. They're kind of wider triangles that are darker in terms of contrast. And then we see a lot of repeating wildflowers. So those are all more circular in shape. And then we have mist that adds simplification and depth. So by taking all of these things and seeing repeating triangles and repeating circles and an, a more abstract quality like atmosphere, we're able to then arrange the scene so that it can potentially be more pleasing. So by thinking about how these triangles are laid out across the scene, then you can think about balance or with, in terms of the wildflowers, you can see that the red wildflowers are, uh, the paintbrush are dotted throughout the scene. And if you start seeing them as abstract shapes, you can think about, well, here's the most appealing way to arrange those abstract shapes. So we're not just photographing trees and flowers, but we're photographing all just sorts of different shapes and, um, and other abstractions. Um, here's another example. So this is an organ pipe cactus in organ pipe cactus national monument down by the Mexico Arizona border. Um, and in this particular case, if you just see a cactus, then you probably could come away with a scene like you see in front of you. But if you get up close and you see the cactus in a less literal way, you can take a photograph like this. So this is getting really up close to the, those, the individual pieces of the cactus and photographing them in a more abstract way. So I'm seeing beyond the literal quality, like this is a cactus and mountains, and instead seeing, well, there are some really interesting sh repeating shapes once you get really close to the cactus. So how could I take a photograph of those abstractions? Here's another example. So the qu question would be that people, this is in, uh, on the side of a dirt road near my house, um, and. I think when people were driving by, they're like, what is that woman doing photographing this weed? Well, it's actually, it turned into the cover of one of my eBooks. So that's what this looks like. So that weed, if you see it as more than just a plant growing on the side of the road, and instead you get close and you shallowed up the field, you can see radiating lines and repetition and interesting colors. So looking beyond the fact that something looks like a weed and instead 
it can be something more than a weed. And then finally, another really essential abstraction is light, because light can create compositions. So these are some examples of how light creates compositions. Um, it can create lines that weren't there before. It can add depth. So uh, like in the, the top middle example, if that light wasn't there, that scene would look a lot more flat. It can bring contrast, add texture, create shapes, and separate the subject from its background. So these are examples of, of uh, six photographs that without that particular lighting situation, the composition just simply would not work. So light is an essential abstraction when you're working with subjects in nature. So concept number two is visual design. So that's building on the last concept where we're seeing beyond the literal things and instead looking for things like shapes and lines and light. And visual design then builds upon those ideas uh, to give you the tools or additional tools to create compositions. And lines are the most obvious quality of visual design that you see out in nature. So you can see all sorts of different lines and then you can use these lines to create compositions. So uh, in the first example, the trees are par straight parallel lines. In the photograph in the middle, which is a spiral aloe, we then have angular and sharp lines and we have a radiating circle uh, or ra radiating spiral. So those are all like thinking through those those qualities, we can then use those things to create a composition. Um, in the next example to the right, the sand dunes in the upper right, uh, now we have soft and curving lines. The wildflowers on the bottom left, those are radiating lines. And then in the example of badlands on the lower right, we have lines that are converging. So these are elements of visual design that then can be the building blocks of a composition. Uh, some additional design concepts that I find to be helpful are looking for shapes. So in the first example, we see a lot of repeating triangles. Uh, and then the next example is symmetry. So having the things on both the right and the left be fairly symmetrical. In the next example, uh, we have asymmetry and some like uh, the patterns in the foreground are kind of echoing the patterns in this geothermal steam. So an asymmetrical composition, but things that have, there's some repetition in these echoes. Um, the texture would be an additional design concept that I find particularly helpful. And then things like balance. So uh, we, this, this glacier in the middle kind of bisects this lower area and the upper area, creating some balance. And then the light creates layers. So those are all design concepts that if you're able to identify them in nature, then you can use those as tools to create a composition. And I think of one of the most helpful ideas of visual design to be that of structure. Um, and that's particularly because, again, I like organizing chaos. So I think about structure as the organizing principle behind a photograph. And if I were to uh, try to, to figure out the structure of my composition, one of the first things I would think about is let's say I had a piece of paper and a pencil. What would be the first lines or shapes that I would draw of the composition that's in front of me? And those forms, those first things that you draw as a sketch would likely be the main structure of your scene. So once you can see that main structure, then you're able to assess the other compositional qualities like balance and how your overall arrangement works. So I find this idea of like the, the organizing principle or the scaffolding behind my scene to be really a really helpful concept in organizing chaos. Um, so a really obvious example of structure is tree trunks. So this upper right example, the structure here. So if we were to sketch this as a composition, the first thing we would sketch would be these white aspen trunks. Um, and that those are the things that create the structure of this composition. So then I can say, well, here we have some that are kind of radiating from the bottom to the top. I want to repeat that on the right and that, that that helps add balance. So when I'm going through a composition, I can think about some of those ideas. So a couple of other examples of um, 
structures like the of a dominant flow that you see in the seaweed in the upper left or strong lines in the bark that you see in the middle upper photograph, um, anchoring a, a foreground with shapes or excluding a lot of con context to just focus on a, a few key elements. Um, so those would be some examples of, of how I think about structure. So just again, it's an organizing principle for a photograph, the dominant forms that you're using, uh, and then using those things as the basis of your composition. So structure, next time you're out photographing working on, and working on a composition, think about like what are, what are the key structures behind this composition and how can I use that, what I'm seeing, to then better organize and arrange my frame. So concept number three is subject placement. And I, the reason that I include this is because the rule of thirds is almost always the thing that comes up when you talk about composition for nature photographers. And from my perspective, we don't want to think about the rule of thirds. Instead, we should think about the principle of subject placement. So you're deliberate about where you place your subjects based on what you want to communicate and, what, and the qualities of the subject in front of you. So in some cases, centering a photograph makes sense. So in this case, I feel like the, the impact of this photograph comes from the fact that it's centered. If it were offset, if the rosette were on the right or on the left or in the, one of the corners, it would convey a completely different feel. And I feel like in this case, the power of this scene comes from the fact that it's centered. So this is an example of where the rule of thirds would eliminate the power of this photograph. In this case, we, the three corn lilies that are at the center are a little offset from one another. So they create a tri triangle across the diagonal of the photograph. So in this case, so kind of an offset centering works pretty well. In this example, uh, we feel more of a progression from the lower left to the upper right based on the progression of the waves. So for this scene, I felt like that made sense. The, the outlet to the ocean here is placed kind of where the, the rule of thirds would be. So in this case, it makes sense because that's what I was going for with this scene. And then in these two cases, the dominant forms are on the left or the right based on what the needs of the scene are. So this is the whole idea behind this lesson is that get the rule of thirds out of your mind and think of thirds as being one option for arranging your photograph, but it's one of many options and that you want to make the best choice based on what you're trying to accomplish and communicate through your photograph and based on the needs of your subject. So concept number four is repetition. And I find that repetition helps bring cohesiveness to a scene and it helps organize chaos. There are so many things that you can, or so many ways to find repetition in nature. And some examples are patterns, shapes and lines, uh, mirrors and echoes, lights and shadow, and colors. So these are six different ways that I look for repetition in nature. And here are some examples. So uh, patterns where a pattern is more like wallpaper, where you see something like the same thing repeated over and over. In the case of the second example, so the middle upper photograph, you have a lot of repeating vertical lines in the trees. Um, in the next photo, you have repeating subjects. So these main plants are repeated, and then you have them in an arc, and then these are in kind of in an arc as well. So that's another piece of repetition. And then lots of little, these little plants repeat. Uh, the shapes and textures in this example, where you have uh, the textures on the tiles and then the general shape of the, of the, the tiles repeats throughout the frame. So those are some examples of uh, shapes and textures repeating. Um, here we have echoes where this general form is repeated on the right and then repeated on the left. So uh, echoing and then light shadows and layers. So we have the light and the shadow, the light and the shadow. So those repeating throughout the frame and then the layers are an, another type of repetition you find a lot in nature. So those are six examples of different types of repetition in small scenes.
But you can also find repetition in grand landscapes. So uh, in this scene, we have a lot of ar ar arching things within the frame. So we have the rainbow that forms an arch, and then we kind of have that kind of a similar arch here in the reflection. And then all of these mountains are rounded and mounded. So we have clouds that mirror the other forms in the scene. Uh, we have the rainbow that mirrors the other forms. So those kinds of repetition can help bring cohesiveness to a composition for a grand landscape. So concept number five is visual weight. And I think of visual weight as the amount of attention that an element attracts compared to the other elements within a frame. So uh, that I'll show a lot of examples, but generally visual weight can be, can help determine how balanced a composition feels and how cohesive it feels. So some examples of visual weight in this first example on the left, uh, this is the Watchman, which is a, a very visible formation in Zion National Park. And here, the Watchman takes up the entire, most of the frame, and it holds all of the visual weight in this particular scene. In the next example, the middle, that is um, some sea stacks in Olympic National Park. And this is a more balanced composition in terms of visual weight, because the foreground takes up about as much uh, real estate as the background does, uh, the clouds and the, um, the wave patterns in the foreground both take up again a pretty similar amount of space. So I feel like most of these elements hold a pretty similar amount of visual weight. Like they're, they're attracting about the same amount of attention and they're all similarly sized. So this feels like a fairly balanced composition in a lot of different ways to me. Um, and then in the final example, this is the moon, and it's tiny, and it attracts a tremendous amount of visual weight. So um, these Joshua trees take up more space, so, and they, they also hold a lot of visual weight, but the, the moon attracts a lot of attention compared to the other elements in the frame. So when you think about uh, an element like that, it's essential to the composition, even though it's really small. Here's an example that, of a scene that is pretty balanced. So the bottom part of the scene all has fol green foliage. The top generally has mist and trees. The spacing of the trees is fairly balanced. Uh, so this is an example of where most of the things hold a fairly similar amount of visual weight, except for these little pink rhododendrons. So those little pink flowers are very visually different, so they attract more attention. So here's a question. So take a look at this photograph and think to yourself, which rocks carry the most visual weight? So they're all very similarly sized, but I think that there are two in particular that attract a lot more attention than the others, even though they're all similarly sized. Um, and that would be this lower left rock and the upper right rock, and or upper left rock, sorry, upper left and lower left. And I personally think that they, uh, they carry a lot of visual weight, uh, primarily because they're so close to the edge of the frame, that once something gets closer to an edge or a corner, it starts attracting more attention. Um, and this is a scene that I go back and forth between not liking it and liking it a lot. Um, I just wish, this upper left rock were not there because I feel like it just pulls so much visual attention that it, so it holds a lot of visual weight and it attracts a lot of attention that draws your, the viewer away from the more interesting parts of the scene. So that thinking about what parts of your scene are attracting visual weight or attracting attention can really help you decide like, do I need to address this, do I need to eliminate this or do I need to rearrange a composition so that something, so that it feels more balanced or that I don't have a rock right on the edge that pulls away all the attention. So thinking through visual weight of all the elements in your scene can be a really helpful tool in building cohesive and unified compositions. So concept number six is flow and direction. And the idea behind this concept is that most natural features have direction, and you can use that direction to your advantage. 
So uh, fl I think the easiest way to think about this is to look at this photograph. And from my perspective, Half Dome is facing the wrong way. So this is Yosemite National Park. And when we're looking at this scene, the Half Dome is pointing out of the frame. So that's an example of where the flow that you're feeling, like the directional cue here is pointing out of the frame instead of into the frame. Versus this, where everything in the frame has an obvious direction and flow. Like we're flowing from the lower left to the upper right and it feels cohesive without anything breaking that visual progression. Same thing with this example, where the lines are receding and they offer depth, um, but there's, there's nothing there to distract you or to lead you out of the frame. Versus the, the half dome, dome example where it's facing directly to the left when what you really want is the viewer to be looking to the right in the center. Um, here's another example of how shadows help with, with depth and progression. So all of the visual cues in this example are leading you towards the back of the frame. In this particular case, a lot of these green leaves are on the diagonal. So they're adding a flow to what otherwise looks like a, like this particular scene is a lot of repetition. But when you look at the green leaves through the center, you get a diagonal flow through it. So that's another example of where, even though they're just leaves, they have an abstract quality, which is their direction, which adds a diagonal flow. And then we can have flow from ephemeral conditions. So in this case, these waves. Uh, the directional cue here is that these waves are pointing inward. So they lead your line, or they lead your eye into the center of the frame where you can then explore the sea stack and this part of the coast. So if these waves are pointing out to the right, then they would be pointing your attention out away from the things that are in the background. So ephemeral conditions can also provide directional cues. And the helpful thing about these directional cues is that you can then use them to improve your composition. And then our final concept is uh, interactions and relationships. And I see this, this concept as the way that you pull a composition together. So, uh, this is how you, when you step back and you think about how all of your elements in the frame work together or how they don't. And one really obvious example of this is how close things get to one another. So this is Mount Rainier National Park and I was, this it was snowing and icy and there is a very small space that you could stand to get this photograph without going off the trail, which I try not to do in this kind of situation. And my tripod just, like, I wish it was just maybe a foot higher because you see some of these, the relationships between these trees and the, the reflection. There are a few points where it just gets a little too close. So that's an example of where a relationship, like, I wish that there were just a little bit more breathing room in terms of how the trees are re, re, uh, interacting with the reflection. So just thinking about the relationships between all of the different elements in, of your frame and how they work together in terms of balance and cohesiveness and flow. So here's an example that I feel is a lot more cohesive and flows much better. And I know it's probably strange to some people, but this is probably my favorite small scene photograph that I took last year. It's just a bunch of grasses in a, in a tidal pool in Washington but I just, I just love the grace in these grasses for some reason. Um, in this particular composition, I feel like the cohesiveness and the flow, like it all works really well together. Uh, here are four examples of, this, of the same scene that I just don't think worked quite as well. Um, in this case, there's a little bit of bark that's a distraction, and then you have all of these grasses above the water and then these grasses below, which to me just feels a little unbalanced. Um, in this particular case, you have here this one particular grass that I think attracts a lot of visual weight um, compared to some of the others because it's, there's a, some glare and it's just this really strong line. Uh, you have another really bright line here. 
Um, in this case, you have a little piece of the grass sticking up out of the water, and then a bunch of the grasses underneath the water here. Uh, again, I, I like the diagonal flow, but it just, you have all these little grasses sticking up that just are cut off. And then this one feels messy. So you have in the lower right, this little bit, bit of messiness, this kind of empty space on the right. So those are examples of the same scene, but I just don't think it flows nearly as well as this final version. So by thinking about those kinds of details and how all of the different parts of the scene are interacting with each other, you can refine it. So in this case, I zoomed in a lot. Um, you can refine a scene so that it flows and has, is more cohesive. And then the final example that I will give is this photo of Death Valley National Park. And I have been to this spot so many times and finally had a sky that worked out. Um, so this one feels like it was a lot of hard work. Uh, but I feel like the, everything works well together. Uh, it feels balanced to me, but in terms of the foreground, so two lines coming in at equal distances on, or from the corners and then kind of at equal distances along the bottom edge of the frame. All of these little uh, salt patterns are fairly evenly sized, so they feel cohesive to me. And then I feel like the flow in from the salt in the foreground to the mountains in the background to the sky, like all of those things work well together and feel, feel like they, they have the shapes and uh, the flow that connects the foreground to the background to the sky. So uh, those are some things that when I'm out in the field, I think about in terms of relationships so that I can be thinking about like, how is the foreground interacting with the mountains and interacting with the sky in a way that then creates a, a cohesive composition. And then finally, details really matter. So uh, the, some of the key ideas around details is thinking about what's the structure, that organizing principle be behind your photograph. How do things flow and progress and relate to one another? And thinking about that for the whole scene and the key, the key subjects within your scene. Uh, I also like to think about making sure that it feels like my scene expands beyond the edges of the frame. So uh, in any case where uh, like it feels like there are distractions on the edges, I want to try to eliminate those, those distractions so that it feels like my scene expands. Um, I always want to try to make sure that everything I've included inside the frame adds to the scene and that I've minimized distractions or eliminated distractions. Um, so that might be something like uh, in terms of something on an edge like a, or an, a plant that has an imperfection, I might try to eliminate that from my composition so that that's, that distraction is eliminated or minimized. And then I always check my edges and corners to make sure that they're, they're clean and uh, like I think about a margin around my frame and make sure that the, sub, the main subjects of my frame aren't entering that margin, that they're more centered towards the center of the, the frame and that the edges and corners are generally clean. So those are some examples of details that I always pay attention to because I think that they're particularly important when uh, I'm working on a composition. So with that, I will wrap up with four recommendations. So if you are looking to improve your compositional skills, I would encourage you to practice often in low pressure situations. So go, going to a, your, your garden, going to a local nature reserve, practicing in your backyard, so that you, you build your skills before you go on a big trip. Uh, study your own photographs to identify your themes, your weaknesses, and your opportunities for growth. So by looking at what you're doing well, you can amplify that and looking at some of the things that don't work as well, you can then work on improving those things next time you're outside. Uh, really work on building your observational skills. So regardless of where you're at, if it's in your house, if it's just walking around your neighborhood, if you're at the grocery store, if you're running errands, if you're on a trip, taking those, those opportunities to improve your observational skills uh, learning how to really observe light and build your visual design toolbox, that those are all key things that can help build your composition skills. Because if you do those things, then you build your toolbox of 
of concepts and ideas that you can apply in the future. And then finally, I really encourage you to just experiment and play around just to learn, not to necessarily take portfolio quality photographs, but just to build your skills. So as one final reminder, uh, all of these ideas are included in my new ebook, uh, which is 11 composition lessons for photographing nature's small scenes. And I go into a lot more depth with a lot more examples. So if you want to get into some more of these or some more depth with these concepts, you might find this to be helpful. And um, I like I said before, I have a lot of other tutorials and eBooks and you can use the code Chicago to save 15% on any of those things. Um, I also have a newsletter that I send out regularly. Um, I'm sending one out tomorrow that includes some information about free webinars that I'm going to be offering with some colleagues. So um, our, you can go to my website at naturephotoguides.com to learn more about our free newsletter, our free webinars, workshops, eBooks, video tutorials, all sorts of photo education things. Um, and if you have any questions that you don't feel comfortable asking tonight or that you think about later, I'm always happy to hear from you. So feel free to email me or uh, here's my email address, sarahmarinophoto at gmail.com. And again, my website is naturephotoguides.com. So with that, I fit in a lot of information and hopefully you found that helpful. Absolutely. Um, if everyone would, uh, if you have questions, please put it in the chat and I can either read them to you if you can't see. Um, if you can. I see it now. Oh, you see the chat now. Okay. Yes. Uh, if I, I, I have a question uh, and, and while we wait for anybody to, to ask their questions. Um, tell us about your, um, your editing workflow. Like what's, or your, your concepts, you know, there's a lot of, we have a lot of like nature clubs around here where they don't want you to touch the shot, you know, it's like minimal processing, you know, there's the rule, all these rules about how much, what you can do to the shot. We're not, the Garden Photographic Society is not, is a, we're a general photography club. So we don't have those similar rules, you know? So like when you say sometimes like, well, I, this is this rock is too close to the edge, you know, typically a club like us would say, well, why don't you just clone it out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you talk about, tell me what, what your uh, approach to it is and whether that's, you know, something that you think of or not when you're shooting, like I could just get rid of this whole boat right there, you know, because it's in my way, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, so I think of nature photography as a creative artistic pursuit. So that means that I, I don't think of the JPEG. If a JPEG were to come out of my camera, like I don't see that as being final. So that's my personal, just general approach. So in, if we think of a continuum between that's a one where you aren't doing any manipulation to a 10, uh, like somebody who is dropping in skies, like that they're taking multiple scenes and putting it into a single photograph, I probably fall at like a three or a four. So uh, that example of the rock where I said that I would, I would not clone out that rock, but I have tried to warp it so that it's further away from the edge. Um, like that is just an example. I do a lot of photo processing on my plant photos because I even though that I didn't show very many of my plant photos today, um, a lot of them are really light and bright and very low contrast. So uh, I'll bring up the blacks, bring up the, the shadows, really brighten the scene significantly. So in that particular case, uh, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm approaching a subject and rendering it in a way that's very different than you would see it with your eye. So that that's, I'm making a lot of creative choices. So generally, like, I feel like the, one of the things that keeps me engaged in nature photography is that it's really challenging and dropping in the sky would eliminate a lot of that challenge. So that to me is just not particularly appealing because it's not in line with the thing that I, the reason that I do nature photography, but I also see it as a creative pursuit. So I feel like I take a pretty kind of middle of the road approach where I, I do process my photos creatively, but I keep them grounded in reality. Cool. Um, there's another, sh um, you can see there in the chat. Yeah. Do you have a favorite lens? I actually wanted to ask you as well, in, in some of your macro shots, are you using, 
a dedicated macro lens or like a lens baby, something specific to macro uh, shooting? What, what about lenses? Um, so I have five lenses, a 16 to 35 wide angle, a 24 to 105 mid-range telephoto, 100 to 400 telephoto lens, a 100 millimeter macro, and uh, the longest lens baby. So I think an 85 velvet. And uh, my favorite is the 100 to 400, which I consider both my uh, secondary macro lens and then just a normal telephoto. So I take a lot of my plant photos and my macro photos are not, mac not true macro, but detail photos with my 100 to 400. So if I had to choose a single lens, it would be that 100 to 400, which will hopefully soon be the Canon 100 to 500 since they just announced that lens. So, um, but I really like using a macro lens too. It, for the type of things that I photograph though, I'm sometimes in such awkward positions that having a fixed prime is really challenging. So I like the, I appreciate the ability to have the flexibility of a telephoto zoom. Um, another question, it says, uh, in the photo of the pebbles, why didn't the large light colored pebble sort of in the center carry weight? I'm looking back at the photo. Cause I, cause I remember thinking, oh, well, which are the most, have the most weight? I, that was like the brightest rot of pebble. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, the, well, that would carry uh, some weight because it was, yeah. Yeah. So I put it um, up here and during the, or I'll actually mention a couple of other things that I would say catch my eye in terms of visual weight. So this little bit of, uh, this little imperfection here of sand that you see along the left edge. So that's very similar to this, but because it's right on the edge, it catches a lot more attention. Um, this rock that's broken, the last time I did this presentation, somebody said, because the rock is broken, it catches a lot of attention. Um, these two are pretty bright. Uh, this one blends in a lot. So I think that, that from my perspective though, those don't catch quite as much attention as the, these two that are right by the edge of the frame. But this is another example of how that's very personal. Like some, like what catches my eye is not necessarily what's going to catch your eye. It's more that you're thinking about these things in terms of your own phot photography. Uh, so uh, like, what do you think in a scene has the most visual weight? And do you think that that's appealing or unappealing? I think that's more, that's a more essential question than which of the rocks in this particular photo carry the most visual weight. I think that would be my response to to that question. Right, then there's also the uh, phenomenon of you've looked at that shot a thousand times more than we've looked at that shot. Yeah. So that, That's you know, <laughs> then your own, yeah, your own kind of idiosyncrasies, what, what you value, again, getting back to your point about your mood and your feelings informing your work. Uh, um, I think that's one of the things that I take the most <laughs> after presentation that um, you, you go with an intent, you, you follow your feelings and your relation to nature, and that informs what you shoot and how you shoot it. And, and my husband is also a nature photographer, and we're drawn to very different scenes. So uh, like in this particular case of the, all of those, those rocks and patterns, I, I think that he would probably have taken, like his rendition of that scene would have probably been more dramatic and more aggressive in terms of the lines um, than mine. So it's just different ways of seeing things. And so when I am thinking about an idea like visual weight, how I see it isn't as important as the fact that we, that you're thinking about it in your own composition. Uh, someone wants to know if you have an Instagram uh, account that they could follow. I have two and I can type them in. So Sarah Marino photo is my, um, color profile and it's pathetic that I don't know what my black and white one is. Because <laughs> even though I didn't show that many black and white photos, I actually prefer black and white photography. So sarahmarino.bw. So those are my two Instagram accounts. Dot .bw. Cool. Um, Oh, okay, great. Uh, any other um, 
questions from anybody? I've unmuted everyone so you can just talk or unmute yourself. I've got a question. George. Sarah did mention the cropping. You know, so she showed some of her losers, which I didn't think were too bad. And I thought some cropping would have just, you know, you know, you had a, a, a several verticals. And I thought, oh, just the top half would be a dynamite shot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you didn't mention the you know, severe cropping or, you know, judicious cropping. Yeah, and I, I think that's another example of a personal preference is I very rarely crop my photos. Uh, um, so I have a very deliberate, slow process generally when I'm out photographing and it, except for doing things like straightening a horizon or trimming a little bit off of a scene. Um, I just, gen when I get home, I just don't go to cropping as an option. So it's very much a personal process type of thing where, Thanks. yeah, I, yeah. It, now that I'm going to hopefully buy this new Canon camera that's like a 45 megapixel camera, then I might start cropping more liberally. But right, right. Um, historically, I just, uh, it just goes back to my process, which is very deliberate and slow and intentional. So um, I feel like, like 99 times out of 100, I don't crop. Sometimes I, I, I'm open to a radical crop here and there, but <laughs> generally not. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks everyone. It was nice to connect with you all and thanks for staying tuned during a long presentation. And if any of you have more questions afterwards, again, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to chat about photography with anyone. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. We'll uh, we'll check Great out presentation. Thank Thanks. We'll check thank out you your so uh, your ebook uh, online uh, for uh, for the refresher of these interesting and somewhat iconoclastic ideas that you have <laughs> about photography, which I really like, <laughs> because that's our particularly our club. You know, uh, we're we're a general photography club, but that's what I call an art club. You know, we want to make art. You know, and uh, so that's. We're, we're moved by someone who is, says, throw out the rules. I got my own rules. Yeah. I'm going to make up, I'm going to invent my own rules. You know, yeah, sometimes I can tell that with some photo clubs, they don't exactly like some of those intro slides that I included in my presentation. <laughs> right, but. Yeah. You, got, you, you got, we're your audience right here. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.